All right, if you'll take your seats now and take uh, the word, turn to Romans 8. We have about this Sunday, I, and I'm going to try to finish Romans 8 next Sunday, and then we'll move to Romans 9. <laughs> You're going to pray about that, aren't you, Dr. Rendell? I need your prayers. The church needs your prayers. <laughs> we could skip Romans 9 altogether. Um, I know some of you have read ahead, but it's a wonderful chapter. And, um, it, but today we're going to finish uh, dealing with a section in Romans 8 that is really connected to what we talked about last Sunday. Before I get there, I want to remind you that through the month of June, we are showering the care center with much-needed supplies that they need over there in South Haven. We do this every year. And there's a table set up in the foyer. You probably noticed it when you came in. It's got the baby theme, shower theme to it. So uh, on that table, there's a list of the items that the care center needs. They constantly need these items. And uh, if you go over there, which I encourage you to do that, uh, and look at their, their storeroom and their storage areas, it's packed with things that just constantly turn over because there's a big need for the items that are that are listed out there. So as you go out this morning, pick up one of those pieces of paper, take it with you to Walmart or Target or Kroger or wherever you do your shopping, and, and buy as much as you can and then bring it next Sunday. Just place it on that table. When that gets full, we'll just stack it in the floor around there and then sometime in July, uh, we'll deliver that to the care center, all right? It's a way to, that we can bless them beyond the, the uh, regular support, financial support that we give them. This morning we're going to begin reading in verse 19 and we'll stop at verse 23, all right? Paul, uh, Paul says, For the ex earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. Another word for that would be frustration. Not willingly, but because of him who, is subject, who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage, slavery, of corruption or decay into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption of the redemption of our bodies. Now church, this morning as we come to verses 20 and 21, the subject of redemption changes. Last week we talked about our own redemption. Paul here is not talking about the redemption of man, nor rational creation, humans. Here he's talking about the redemption of non-rational creation, or the, the redemption of the physical world. Matter, plants, and animals. And so if we take this into account and believe the Word of God, we can properly develop a biblical view of the world and our life. All right? So that's what we're going to work on this morning. So with Paul's teaching here, this means if the world, that is the cosmos, if, if matter... If plants and animals need redemption, it means that presently, in its present state, something is wrong. Creation is longing, too, for the day of liberation, the day when it will be set free from bondage or from slavery. You remember... After Adam and Eve sinned in the very words, after God was declaring judgment because of their sin, they would lose their community with God. They would be separated from God because of their sin. The sin of Adam and Eve also extended to the physical creation. 
You remember these words in Genesis 3.17. Jesus, or God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. So as sin chokes out life in man, for the Hebrew text says, Dying you will die. As sin chokes out life for the human race, undesirable growth would would be the constant threat to the crops and the gardens of which the humans would need to survive. It will be a constant fight for us now uh, to produce the kind of crops and plants that we need to live. And if you do any gardening at all, you know what I'm talking about. Philip's in the business of killing unwanted plants and weeds that choke out the good things. And we see this in everyday life. We see it with thorns and thistles that plague creation. Now, what I want to do today is help us, help you develop what many call a world and life view. You know, the question is always there. Whether man realizes it or not, some people are so busy living life that they don't stop and think about this much, but occasionally something will happen and we will be stopped in our tracks and we will give thought to what we would call spiritual things or those questions that we, man struggles to answer. For example, the question, where did we come from? Where did this world come from? Where did we come from as humans? That's a fundamental question in this thing of world and life view. There's another question that's often asked. Why are we here? Is there purpose? Is there meaning to life? Are we just here to live out hopefully 60, 70, 80 years and then we pass into nothingness? Or do we have a divine purpose? Where did we come from? Why are we here? And then that great question that has always been asked by philosophers and theologians and everyday men and women. Is there anything after this life? Is there something beyond death? Well, that's what we would call today Christian of the world and life view. And I, I want to tell you that the world's answer to those questions is different from the Christian's answer. Paul helps us here in Romans 8 to develop what we would call a biblical or Christian world and life view. We can answer those questions from a biblical perspective. Now I want to say that the Christian view of creation, of course, is radically different from the world's view. That is, the, the unbeliever's view. There are Men who are not Christians, men and women, they have a completely different view in many cases. Uh, different answers to those questions I've proposed this morning. Institutions do. Sydney, you're about to go off to a university not far from here. The university in Oxford. Not Oxford, but Ole Miss. And even that institution... And to a large degree, you're going to learn they have a different answer to these questions that I have proposed this morning. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we headed? If you travel to Oxford and Oxford, England, those universities, all the universities in Cambridge, England, those, many of those will have a different answer to the questions that we've proposed this morning. And in general, the unbeliever, the non-believer, the world makes either of one or two mistakes when it comes to the issue of the world, the creation. Either the world deifies co the cosmos or creation, makes it an idol, or the world, the unbeliever, will regard the world or the cosmos as well as human beings as undergoing an evolutionary progression. Many believe that we are progressing to an ultimate state of perfection. And you just have to watch the news. If that's true, we had a ter another terrible setback in England, in London, yesterday. Are we moving to a state of perfection or not? 
So we're going to look and see this morning what Paul says about that because Paul gives us another view when he says this. The whole creation groans and labors. That's another translation. Our, the New King James says waits in eager expectation. Uh, and that could be translated this way. We're standing on our tiptoes waiting in expectation to what God is going to reveal. And I believe when Paul said those words, I believe he was including creation itself. The natural world is waiting to, looking in expectation for the redemption of man. See, as, and what is creation waiting for? Verse 20, it says redemption. For creation, look at verse 20 again. For creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty or freedom of the world, of, or, uh, of the children of God, of us, and that it too will share in that liberation. You see, the natural world has much to gain through our redemption. It too will benefit. So the Christian world and life view is what we're going to look at this morning. And in these verses, we, three, we see three parts to this biblical world view that I want to share with you. The first one is this. We see through Paul's teaching that this is God's world. It belongs to God. Everything in Romans 8 presupposes this. Even the term creation presupposes what? There's a creator. There had to be someone behind this world. Not only does the Bible teach us this, really reason tells us this. For in order for creation to come into being by itself, it would have to have created itself. And that would mean that it would have to have been in existence before it was created. That's non-rational. I'm just making the point, the argument, that rational thinking, reason tells us that there has to be a divine creator behind this world. Now I know I don't need to defend the doctrine of creationism. I, I think probably most everyone here believes uh, in this rational view of origins that God made everything. But I want you to understand this. Not only does the Bible say that God created everything, He spoke and out of nothing came the world. Not only did He create everything, but the Bible says right now this very moment that all things are being held together by God. Paul told the Colossian church, by him, all things consist. And that word, consist, is a very interesting word. It, it means to be held together. God is holding together the world. In other words, we cannot exist apart from the power of God. We are not self-existent. The very air that you're breathing this moment, if it's altered by one minute chemical alteration, we would stop breathing and in six to ten minutes we would be suffering brain death. We're so dependent upon God. Now, the Bible tells us that God is self-existent. He doesn't depend upon anything outside of himself. We do, but not God. And that doctrine is called the doctrine of aseity. It's not a hard word. A-S-E-I-T-Y. The doctrine of aseity. Self-existent. God is the only one who is self-existent. Now, the consequence... The consequence of this teaching, that the world belongs to God, all creation belongs to God, it means this consequence. 
the world, all creation, has value. You see, it doesn't have value because human beings or some organization declares it to have value. It has value because God created it and it's valuable to Him, so creation should be valuable to us. You see, we are still under what is called the cultural mandate. This was given to Adam and Eve. The garden was given to them. God said, I'm going to give you this paradise, and you are to take care of this paradise. And we, we're still under that mandate to take care of creation, to appreciate it, to value creation. There's a wonderful hymn, I don't know if you noticed it or not, Carla, she does this kind of thing because sometimes I preach to her during the week, you know, the sermon for the coming Sunday, and, and I was talking about this hymn that in times past we used to sing, This Is My Father's World. Do you ever sing that hymn growing up? It was written by a Presbyterian minister who was a, really a great preacher, pastor during his time. And he, he was also a, an accomplished musician. He was an accomplished organist and pianist and violin, violinist, and he loved music. And he would often say that music, he, the world is the music, Creation is the music of the spheres. And he, he was also an athlete. He loved to exercise. And when he would leave to go out for a, a walk, he would often tell his family that he was going out to enjoy God's creation, God's garden, or God's world. And he wrote this hymn, This is My Father's World. I love it. And there's a verse... The last verse of the hymn goes like this. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that, to, that though the wrong seems off so strong, like last night when we saw on the news what was happening in London, though oft we see so strong, oh, let us not uh, ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. Then he says this, This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied. And he closes the hymn with this phrase. Listen. And earth and heaven be one. You know what he understood? He understood the doctrine of the new earth. And that one day we were headed, creation is headed for redemption. And there would one day be a new heaven and earth. And the new heaven, new earth would be one. Why? Because one day Jesus is going to come and reign on a new earth. And where Jesus is, that's where heaven is. That's the doctrine of the new earth. And that's, we believe that here at Hope Community Church. So, God owns the world, and it has value. But we don't worship creation, do we, as an end in itself. We worship the Creator who made it. Secondly, Paul teaches us here that this world was not what it was created to be. See, the problem with the world, it, it's not caused by those the problems, that, the problems with the cosmos are not only those that the human race has inflicted on it. We have caused destruction. We do pollute the world. But the world has also been subject or subjected to troubles as a result of God's judgment on man that he rendered at the time of the fall. Again, cursed is the ground. You will have to fight, work hard now because of sin. Now, nature has not sinned. We have. Man did. But the world was subjected to a downgrading because of man's sin, and it entered thus into God's judgment. And Paul uses, in a couple of verses here, 
verses 20 and 21, he uses three words to describe the judgment that the, the creation, the world is under. And one of those words we saw in verse 20 was frustration. Another word for it is futility. And I, I think here we have a picture of creation's frustration in the way that nature asserts itself in its annual renewal at springtime. Spring comes, and right now, you look in your flower gardens, if you have those, you, you look at the beautiful blooms of creation, and everything has turned green, and there's life again, and we notice it, it catches our attention after a long, barren winter. But this springtime that brings green and the blooms and the blossoms and the crops and a harvest will only once again be defeated by winter. As it sets in, everything will die. You see, it's as if nature always wants to be glorious, but something keeps holding it, holding it back again and again. I think this is most beautifully portrayed in the trilogy, the first part of Lewis's trilogy, the Chronicles of Narnia. And in the land of Narnia, it was controlled by the wicked witch, you remember. And thus it was locked into a state of perpetual winter. Spring never came. Always winter. But when Ashland died and rose again, which was a picture of Christ's resurrection, then the ice and the snow began to melt, flowers began to bloom, trees turned green, and eternal spring was once again brought into existence. See, frustration, Paul says, creation is frustrated. And he uses another word in verse 21, bondage or slavery. Well, frustration has to do with the resulting feelings Bondage speaks of the state of being, of creation. Bondage, as if nature is held captive. Paul is saying here, whereas nature doesn't want to remain as it is, it's powerless to do anything on its own. It can't do anything about it. So creation longs to be delivered. Delivered by God. The third word he uses to describe the state of the world or creation is in verse 21 as well. Decay or corruption. The world is in a state of corruption or decay. Every scientist would agree that the quality of matter and energy is gradually deteriorating over time. There's a law, law of nature, law of heat and energy called the second law of thermo thermodynamics. You can read about it. Matter, energy is deteriorating over time, decay. And certainly Paul didn't know anything about the laws of thermodynamics, but I believe when he wrote this, he was thinking specifically about death, that we are dying. Things, as soon as they are born, the dying process begins. And I believe this is why human beings fear death to a certain degree. Because we were not created to die. We were created to live. You see, death is not really natural. We're dying. We're under this curse, decay. But Christ has defeated that. Spring will come. Death and decay, although the, are the consequence of the fall, one day God will reverse that current law of nature. And that brings us to the third point this morning. The world will one day be renewed. You see, that's, that's the answer to that third question of our world and life view. Where are we headed? I'll tell you where we're headed, including the world creation. Renewal. Listen to me. This third point of the world in life view, despite creation's current frustration, 
bondage, decay. The day is coming when the world will be renewed by Christ. Spring will come. And that frustration that we're currently experiencing will be past history. And I think the closest we can come to understanding this is Paul's reference to the redemption of our bodies in verse 24. For we were saved in hope, but hope that is not seen. Excuse me, verse 23. We eagerly wait, are waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, the physical body. It too will be redeemed. Now listen, the redemption of our bodies, what does that mean? It means the resurrection of our bodies. The body will be resurrected. If you have loved ones who are in the grave right now, even people who have been lost at sea and their bodies have been over time completely deteriorated, God is powerful enough to bring those particles, those matter, that matter, those cells back together and it will be resurrected, renewed one day. Isn't that great? In our resurrection, guys, we will have a continuity of bodies. Our earthly bodies will be raised. But I, the good news is our bodies will be different. They will be heavenly, glorified bodies. See, creation, we're probably experiencing something similar to that. Creation itself will be delivered from its decay and its corruption. Verse 21. So the redemption of our bodies means the re a resurrection of our bodies. Listen, Christ died to what? Redeem our souls. He rose again to redeem our bodies. And then, fourthly, we can talk about this paradise one day that's going to be regained. All that Adam and Eve had before the fall... That's going to be regained, and then some. Even as God pronounced judgment upon Satan in Genesis 3, he was also giving a promise of a future deliverer. Genesis 3, on the earliest sections of Scripture, even there, God is giving us a promise that there will be salvation, there will be redemption. He said and to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And then he, Christ, will crush your head, Satan's head, and you, Satan, will strike his heel. Prophetic words of what would happen in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the, these words were prophesying that Christ, the Messiah, would come, invade human history, take on a human body, and die so that we might live again, and all things would become new. This was the promise, that Jesus would come one day to save those who believe on Him. But it was more than that. It was a promise that in Christ, God would what? Frustrate Satan. Satan has always wanted to undo God's plan. Satan is about destruction. He's about death, not life. And God is promising here that in the end, Satan would find complete frustration. He would be defeated. God would undo his destructive works and once again bring a redeemed human race into a redeemed creation. Now, none of this, none of us know what all of this entails, that is the future. But we have a lot of insight given to us in Scripture. And one of those sections of Scripture where we get insight into what coming for us in the future is found in Isaiah chapter 11. I want to look at this. Isaiah 11 verses 6 through 9. I'll tell you, in 2006, I had set aside that year to read my Bible through again from cover to cover. 
And on a Saturday in 2006, I had come one Saturday morning to my readings, and it had brought me to Isaiah chapter 11. And I read these words that morning. Little did I know that that evening I would get a phone call from my sister that my father had left this world and stepped into eternity. But it was on that morning, the day of my father's departing of this world, and going to heaven to be with Christ, I read these words. And then the Holy Spirit just encouraged me to, to share these words at my father's funeral a few days later. And I read parts of Isaiah 11. I just want to read verses 6 through 9. Isaiah is prophesying of a coming day when he says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. The young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the winged child shall put his hand into the viper's den, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now you know what? You might say, well that's poetry, Pastor. And I would say to you, you're exactly right. But the Bible has a lot of poetry in it. But that doesn't mean that it's fantasy. See, what a powerful picture here of a redeemed world. And the creation, Paul says, is waiting for that day. And the question is, are you? Are you waiting in hopeful expectation? Are you living your life in hopeful expectation that there is a future for us beyond this current life? Let me close, guys. I've been, I've been trying to commend you in the last few weeks to develop this Christian perspective of life. A world in life view, I called it this morning. That is, this is God's world. It's not what it was meant to be. But God has promised to make it all things new. And certainly that includes those who are redeemed, those who have been are in Christ. We have a promise of a renewed body and a new life on a new earth. And if you'll think like that, if you'll get these biblical things in your mind and in your heart, and you'll, as Paul said, think on these things, it will change the way you look at life. It, it, for, for example, you won't be surprised when things go wrong in this life. You see, they will. We live in a fallen world. We're fallen people. We make bad choices. Our plans will sometimes misfire. We will fail. You will sin. We're sinners. You'll make unwise decisions. There are laws in place, spiritual laws. The Bible is very clear. These laws are in place, and if we violate those laws, we will suffer, like the law of sowing and reaping. We're not, because we're Christians, we're not immune to that law. If we sow bad wheat, we will reap the harvest. Sometimes others will seek to destroy what we have spent years trying to accomplish. But listen, the point is not, is not how you succeed in this life. That's not what life is all about. We're not against success. God's not a, against success. The greater, most important issue is, where have you placed your hope? Is your hope placed in this gospel that Paul has declared so clearly to us in Romans 8? Have you placed your hope in God and His faithfulness, His promises? Secondly, you won't put your hope in anything human to improve your conditions. Guys, don't put your hope in 
any political party. Don't put your ultimate hope in any president or any institution. Don't put your hope in, in anything in this world. I'm not saying that we should not live and work to make our society better. We ought to. There's this really fascinating story in Luke chapter 2. I love the Gospel of Luke because he shares so much detail. And in Luke chapter 2, you can miss this story because it's placed in the greater context of the birth of Christ. And, but in Luke 2, he tells this story about when Mary and Joseph took the baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. It was a common practice for the Jews. It was a law requirement that after the days of the mother's purification, they would take their child to the temple and it would be given to the Lord, dedicated to the Lord. And I preached a sermon on that text one Sunday many years ago. And in that text, it mentions, Luke mentions that when they entered the temple, there was a man there who, by the, who, whose name was Simeon. You remember that story? And it said that Simeon was waiting. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. You know what that means? That he believed God's promise. That God was going to make all things new. He was going to send a Redeemer, a Messiah. He believed it. And he was waiting, eagerly waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now that's the question I've proposed to you this morning. Are you waiting in eager expectation? Because if you are, it will change your attitude about this current life, about your troubles. And you won't put your hope in anything this world can do. You'll put your hope in what God has promised. But there was a, something that Luke included about Simeon that I think was very important. I think really it was the real purpose of including the story. Because it, te it says that Simeon was a just and devout man. And that's what I preached on that Sunday. And my point was this. Guys, if our hope and expectation is in the coming redemption, the new world, what God has promised, His faithfulness, then it will change the way we live in this life. We will be like Simeon. We'll be just. You know what that means? will be fair, men and women of integrity in this life. We won't cheat. We won't try to get around the law. We'll look at our neighbors, no matter their race, no matter their background, and we'll see value in them because they're God's creation. And that word just could go, we could make hundreds of applications the way it impacts our lives. See, some some of you might be suffering today the consequences of unjust living. And I'm saying to you, if you, if you live in eager expectation for the hope that is within us, that we'll be the kind of people we ought to be, then it says he was devout. That means he was a holy man. He loved, he worshipped the God of Israel. And that's the challenge for us this morning. It brings me to the third thing. Will you, you'll keep your eyes on Christ. And the Bible says that He is the author and perfecter, or the finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, chapter 2. See, every person in your life right now has the potential, the capability of disappointing you. It happens, but there's only one, one person who is worthy of, of your complete trust and your worship, and that's Christ. I want us to close this morning with a reading together of a text in 1 John chapter 3. I want you to stand with me. This text will be on the screen. And we're going to read this together aloud. All right, look at the text. Let me read it first. Uh, because I want the words to sink in. And when you say these words along with me in a minute, you'll believe what you're saying. 
But the Apostle John wrote in his first epistle, he said, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's how we ought to live, believing what John said. Let's say that together this morning as we close. You ready? Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now one more thing. When, we're, when the day comes when we're made like him in glory, glorification, Paul is saying, as we saw this morning, that all of creation that's straining right now, that it too, on that day, will too, it too will become glorious. Well, Father, we thank you this morning for the word that we have had before us and we have enjoyed. And I pray that we will take the word and just put it in our hearts. And as Paul said, we will think on these things and consider them. We would meditate on this truth and become believers of it. And as believers, we will practice what we believe. I pray that truth will change the, our attitudes, change dispositions, and it will make us as Simeon. That we would be men and women who are just and men and women who are devout, committed to Christ in all things and in holiness. And I pray, Father, that as we live, we will look at people around us and see value in them. They are God's creation. We'll look at the earth and the world that you've given to us and see value in it because you made it. And as we see corruption and we hear of sin, we hear of terrorism around the world, it will only remind us that you made a promise that one day all things will be made new and all the violence will be ended. And one day, we, your people, will live on a new earth and Christ will be our King and we'll live in peace with Him. Thank you, Father, for that promise. I pray this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I pray that the Lord will go with you and He will make His face shine upon you and He will be gracious to you and He will lift up His, up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Amen.